How did this guy learn to speak near native level Japanese by the age of 21? Well, in this video, I'm going to break down exactly how he went about it so that if you have ambitions to learn a language to a high level, now you're going to know how to do it. If you're new here, then welcome. My name is Ollie Richards, and this channel is all about helping you learn a new language through the power of story so you can become fluent faster and live your best life. And today I'm going to be breaking down Matt's method to learn Japanese through two different angles. First of all, the Matt of today, who's extremely articulate on his views about language learning, and then the Matt of a few years ago, who talks in a much more raw, emotional, passionate way about how he learned. And by combining these two, I think we can really get to the core of how this guy managed to learn such good Japanese. So to kick it off, let's take a look at Matt in action. あの、now, Matt talks about getting to this level in Japanese in about five years. So first of all, we're going to take a very quick journey through the big milestones of Matt's Japanese learning journey, and then circle back and look at some of the important moments in key detail that I think were responsible for his success with Japanese. So I originally got interested in studying Japanese. When I was a freshman in high school, I got into watching ja anime with the actual Japanese audio, not the, the dubs and stuff like I watched when I was a child. And it wasn't that I was the biggest anime fan in the world. It was more just like something about the sound of the language just really pulled me in. It just sounded really elegant and beautiful and just instantly made me extremely interested in the culture. And I wanted to learn more. I'm sure all of us can relate to this initial moment when we first discover a new language. There's something about it that just attracts us and we want to learn more. Matt then had a great opportunity to visit Japan not long after. That summer, I went to... Uh... To Japan for three weeks through like a trip in my school and that was like really awesome I just had a great time it was probably like some of the most the most fun I've ever had in my life because I was just a, just a tourist I just saw the normal tourist stuff and like I went, went to Tokyo one time and saw Akihabara and it was just like I was like yeah this is where my future is right here so you fall in love with a new language you're ready to learn it what's your first step I just googled like how to learn Japanese and started going through random textbooks and I transferred into the Japanese class they had at my high school because I was lucky enough to have a high school that offered Japanese classes. Mm -hmm. And so for the first two years, I was pretty much just doing that. In the summer, I went to the local community college and took the second year of Japanese uh, classes so that when yeah. I was a sophomore in high school, I was able to go into the third year of Japanese classes. So far, this is a pretty standard beginning to a new language. You fall in love with the language, you visit the country, you study for a couple of years. We can all relate to this. Next, Matt has a really unique opportunity to actually go and study abroad in Japan. Uh, this wasn't through my school. It was just this program I found online because I really wanted to have the Japanese high schooler experience that I had seen mm -hmm. in anime so many times. Right. And so I, I found the study abroad program and signed up for it. Matt's a teenager. He's still in high school at this point, And yet he's found and signed himself up for a study abroad program in a Japanese high school. This kind of initiative and self-starter mentality, you're going to see this a lot among high achievers in language learning. So how did it go? I did make a lot of Japanese progress while I was in Japan because I was very gung-ho about continuing to study, continuing to only do Japanese. I would go days without speaking or hearing any English, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I also just got really depressed and miserable. And so mm -hmm. I eventually left early. It was supposed to be a 10-month study abroad, but I came home after six months. So at this point, you're thinking, what happened? What went wrong? Hold that thought. We're going to come back to this later because this is crucial for understanding Matt and Matt's Japanese. Suffice it to say, he goes back to the US and he decides to start studying really hard for another couple of years. And this is where it got him. So I guess about uh, two years after coming back from Japan, I was <laughs> at the point where I could understand Japanese very well. And I could <laughs> read novels pretty much no problem. And <laughs> I could watch movies and stuff no problem. So by this point, five years into his journey, Matt has reached a level in Japanese, which for anyone would be fantastic. He can read, he can understand, he can do anything he needs to in the language. It will be tempting to think, well, it's all right for him. He's a teenager, all the time in the world, five years of study, time in Japan. If only I had that time, then I could be fluent in Japanese too. But remember, for every one mat, there are a thousand or more others who don't have anywhere near as much success. So in order to really understand this, we need to dig deeper. And it comes back to his reasons for wanting to learn Japanese in the first place. Listen to how he describes that feeling of when he first discovered Japanese. I don't care. This is all that matters. This is it. It like wasn't it wasn't a conscious thing. It just came from somewhere somewhere really deep. It was just like so the lightning bolt hit me, and I was like Japan, Japanese. I mean, in hindsight, a lot of that was uh, me not wanting to 
I mean, it was kind of like running away. It was kind of like, I, you know, everyone has their own problems. And I just got this, I was like young and naive. I got this idea in my head. Like, if I went to Japan, everything would be amazing. I really appreciate this honesty from Matt, because I remember exactly what it was like to be a teenager. The confusion, the, the pain over different things, and the willingness to do pretty much anything to move away from pain and towards something more appealing. In Matt's case, this was Japanese. In my case, it was actually French, and I ran away to Paris, but that's a story for another day. As we move forward here, I want you to bear this in mind. I'm going to break down everything that Matt does next, but I want you to remember that this is what's underlying his willingness and his drive to do all of this. So now let's look at what exactly Matt did to learn Japanese. And we need to start with the underlying principle to his method, because the method is unorthodox. But here's what it's all about. There's this common belief in our society that it's impossible to learn a language as an adult the same way that children do. But mm -hmm. this... Uh, this belief is kind of based on a fallacy because a lot of times how this belief kind of comes about in people is that they try to learn a language using, you know, a textbook or a class and they do that for a couple of years and then they don't really get the results they want. And then they conclude, oh, it's because I'm mm -hmm. an adult, I can't learn a language anymore. But in <clears> reality, what that adult was doing was completely different than what a child's actually doing when or an mm -hmm. infant's actually doing when they're acquiring their first language, right? The infant mm -hmm. is listening for tens of thousands of hours, 24-7 completely mm -hmm. surrounded by the language, whereas the person taking the class maybe for like a couple hours a week, they're getting a mm -hmm. very minimal amount of exposure to the language and they're doing completely different activities like learning grammar equations and things like that. So this is the theory that Matt bought into hook, line and sinker at that stage in his life. And this led into a very hardcore interpretation of this approach, which is known in Japanese circles as all Japanese all the time, which is basically to say, toss out the textbooks and spend all of your waking hours immersed in Japanese. You're watching anime, you're reading books, you're listening to the radio, watching movies, listening to music, etc, etc. And Matt took this very, very seriously. So much so that when he actually went on his study abroad trip to Japan, he was more interested in that method than he was actually interacting with the people around him. And I'm like, well, I'd rather just spend that time in the library reading. So, so every day after school, I would just read light novels in the library, like for, for like two or three hours, uh, just sitting there, like looking, and I could barely read at that time, of course. So I was like just looking up almost every word, like trying to understand as much as I could. And so, and yeah, so I couldn't really make any real friends because I couldn't communicate with them. Like <laughs> I didn't speak Japanese. They didn't, they didn't speak English. They didn't want to, to like take the time out to sit and like talk to me like I was a baby and and it seemed like like reading novels and watching anime was like more productive than actually talking to Japanese people. Now if you see my other breakdown video of Xiaoma and how he learned Chinese you'll see the parallels here of actually going to another country and spending your time doing something very antisocial and I think you know most of us would say that is clearly a wasted opportunity but let's imagine that what Matt was doing there in the library was actually the most effective way to use his time to learn Japanese. This come, what this brings up is this philosophy of really how you want to spend your life. Do you want to make the most of the experiences you have around you or do you want to pursue perfection at all costs? And if you've picked up anything useful from this video so far, then hit that like button, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell so I can send you future method breakdown videos just like this. Sorry, Matt, you were saying- I had this idea that I wanted to get perfect in Japanese in 18 months. And so on the weekends, instead of going out and seeing Japan with my host family, I said that I wanted to stay home and make Anki flashcards and just <laughs> okay. do those all day. And um, in, in hindsight, this was a really bad decision. I, If I could go back, I would have not done that. I would have put Japanese to the side a little bit and just enjoyed my study abroad mm -hmm. experience knowing that right, I would have right. the rest of my life to get good at Japanese. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're a teenager, you can be very short-sighted. And so right, I just, yeah. my only goal was I want to be fluent in Japanese 18 months from, from the point I started. So the older, more mature Matt of today would do things differently if he had his time again. And let's face it, which of us wouldn't? But it does raise the interesting question of, this obsession that he had and this drive and dedication that he had uh, for good, for better or for worse, would he have got to the level that he did if it wasn't for that unhealthy obsession? We will never know. But it is important to think about this because just like in the story of Xiaoma and how he learned Chinese with flashcards in China, there is a degree to which like this kind of insane struggle gets you where you want to go. Uh, it wasn't very healthy, probably psychologically. I don't recommend <laughs> people to, to necessarily do this. But um, so I, I did that for six months and made a lot of progress in, the, in those six months. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's just a limit of how, how good you can get at Japanese in six months. So Matt leaves Japan, he goes back to the US, and then he has to decide what to do from that point. His Japanese is a lot better, but he didn't have a very good time in Japan and he's feeling a bit disillusioned. 
And then at that point, it was kind of like, well, what do I do? I didn't really have the best experience in Japan, but I've just dedicated a year of my life to studying Japanese and I've made so mm -hmm. much progress, but mm -hmm. I'm just not quite there. And I just decided that I want to see this through to the end and mm -hmm. just continue to study very intensely while I was in America. This is a dilemma that every language learner faces at some point in their life. You really want to carry on, but it's not making you happy. But then you've spent all this time already. What do you do? And this is precisely why earlier we looked at Matt's real emotional reasons for wanting to learn Japanese, because at a time like this, it's that that makes you decide whether to carry on or not. I was, uh, I think, 17 at this point. And uh, so I was like really, really in a tight situation because I had my whole future bet on this. It's like, what am I going to do if I don't do Japanese? I already had so much of my identity like tied up with that. had had this story where I was going to live the rest of my life there. Like I'm either going to get better or get worse. Like I knew if I stopped studying Japanese, the little that I had would, would be, would just, I'd forget it so quickly. And then within like a few, a few months or a year, then it would be pretty much all gone. It was either all or nothing. It was either I keep doing it full time and get there or I stop and then I would just forget it all. That was like not, forgetting it just didn't feel like an option because I was so invested in it. Language learning is tough. It takes a long time. It's a lot of work. And this is why so often the people who get to very high levels, they're not necessarily the, the best learners. They're just the ones who don't give up. So he decides to carry on. And at this point, he is two and a half, three years into learning Japanese. You might think he'd try something a bit different at this point, but no, he doubles down on this idea that the only way to learn Japanese, the best way to learn Japanese is through complete hardcore immersion. And I was really like, okay, from now on, I only watch Japanese movies. I only watch Japanese TV shows and read Japanese books and hang out with Japanese people. And mm -hmm. I went very extreme on this. This is known as an input-based method. Input being the things that you read and the things that you hear. So what he's not doing is studying textbooks, uh, doing grammar exercises, spending all his time speaking with people. It's the idea that if you spend enough time listening and reading, your comprehension will be so high, you know so much that everything else, like speaking, like perfect grammar, will follow. He also made heavy use of flashcard apps. So he would take words and phrases from the stuff that he was listening to and reading, put them into his flashcards and practice them until he knew them. It very focused on input. So I was just listening and reading Japanese for many hours every day, um, making Anki flashcards for words that would come up in the books and shows that I was consuming that I didn't know. Whenever I talk about learning through immersion, whether it's what Matt did here or my own story learning method, I always get the question, well, how does that convert into speaking? All this reading and listening, how do you learn to speak? Well, this is what Matt describes happening next when he went back to university and had the opportunity to start speaking with Japanese people. Yeah, there was this community of Japanese people at my college. They would all hang out to, with each other and they all knew each other. And so I was able to kind of slide into that community and make friends with them and hang out with Japanese people and actually get to start speaking Japanese. So at that point, it was mostly just 99% input, 1% output. Mm -hmm. But because I had such a strong foundation in input, as soon as I started speaking, I started to get pretty fluent very quickly because my brain right. had seen all the patterns so many times. It only took a little bit of practice to kind of activate all the kind of passive knowledge that I had. So it's not that speaking fluently is effortless and automatic at that stage, but you already understand most of what's being said to you. And you already have such a huge reservoir of knowledge, of words, phrases, grammar yourself that can be developing the ability to speak is a comparatively quick thing and a lot less painful than if you try to start speaking right at the beginning when you don't know anything yet. And just to underscore that point, listen to how Matt went about improving his fluency once he decided to actually start speaking a lot. Yeah, so and so I made a lot of Japanese friends and I got to the point where, where there, there was like probably like a couple hundred Japanese exchange students at my school and I like became famous among them. Cause I was this crit, I was just like the, the white guy who was super good at Japanese. So I'd like meet Japanese people for the first time. Like I had this bad habit of whenever I saw a Japanese person, I had to talk to them. And I, I'd always, the conversation would always be the same. That's the thing. It's like, I'd be like, Hey, are you Japanese? And, and they'd be like, like say yes. And like broken English. And I'm like, Oh, I can speak Japanese. And they'd be like, really? Let me see. And then I just start switching into fluent Japanese and they'd be like blown away. The conversation would always be the same. And I'd be like, oh, how come you're so good at Japanese? Like, oh, how, what made you want to say Japanese? Blah, 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 blah. And so since I had the same conversation, like, hundreds of times, I, like, perfected it. Like, I would try every possibility, see how it went, try a different one next time, until I got to, like, the perfect formula of how to blow a Japanese person's mind, like, as much as possible. And what I love here is the intention and the ambition. And this is something to think about in your own learning, if you've ever found yourself wondering, you know, why am I not better at speaking? Are you actually taking control and agency of your own learning? And you know, of all the qualities of language learners out there, it's the people who really take control of their learning, don't rely on anybody else, but decide what they want and go and make it happen, who have the most success. And what's most impressive about Matt is that he just sticks at it and will not give 
up. But there is more than one way to skin a cat. And in this video over here, you're gonna see an example of how one guy learned Mandarin Chinese to a very high level by the age of 21. And as you're watching that video, I want you to think about the similarities between his approach and what we've seen here from Matt.